All right, great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Will Bateman, as I've just been explained. So I'm going to dive straight in. Um, two weeks ago, I was in Mexico. Um, we had some meetings with some hotels out there. And we were also doing some filming for a crowdfunding campaign that we're about to, about to launch. And we took this photograph. And you can see quite clearly here how the sand in front of these hotels has eroded away to, in places to less than a metre. And obviously, they're taking some quite drastic actions to try to shore up their, their coastline. And in particular, because I was with a film crew, they, were, they wanted one of these deck chairs to just put all their equipment on. So I went out back, went to talk to the reception, and said, look, can, I, can we have one of these deck chairs to rent? And they produced a thing that looks a bit like a chessboard, and I said, oh, I want the one on the beachfront. And they pointed to the middle of the chessboard. And to see that effect, what was actually happening was they used to have deck chairs going way out into the middle here. Um, and they had about eight to 10 extra deck chairs from what I was actually able to, able to rent. And this is a map just from Google, Google Earth, just, you know, just taken this, um, well, I think yesterday. So you can see a very dramatic change. And Google isn't that out of date. This has happened over the last couple of years. Now, this is clearly a big issue. And if you stay with Google, you type into Google beach erosion, then you will get back something in the order of about 80 million um, results. And if you flip through to image, image search, you can see a picture a bit like this. So this is clearly a big issue. And globally, you can look around, and it's affecting everybody around the world. But coastal erosion isn't new. Um, you know, it's been going on for a long time. A lot of the sand that we actually that we we see is is in itself a product of erosion, and also you know things like the White Cliffs of Dover that make England very famous are a product of constant erosion, which keeps them keeps them keeps them white. But globally, around 70% of our coral reefs are sorry, 70% of our coastlines are experiencing increased erosion. And beaches are a very, you know, like many things in nature, are a, a balancing act between a number of different forces. First of all, you have the erosion of, of the land itself. So that's what brings a lot of the sediment down. It's carried down by the rivers. And s smaller grains tend to get washed out to sea, and larger grains end up being, making up the sand that forms our beaches. But on top of that, you have things, you know, smaller waves, such as this, tend to move sand onto a beach. Larger waves tend to actually take sand further out to sea. And then, of course, you have currents and wind and a load of other sort of factors that come together. But what's important to understand is that the shape of your beach is a, a combination of the sort of, you know, the, it's, the average, it's, it's the average from across the year of all of these different forces that have formed that. And the shape of a beach that you have for relatively calm wave environment will be very different to that from a, where the waves are much bigger. For example, Hawaii has fantastic beaches, but they also have very large waves. The two can coexist. But when you go to somewhere like Mexico, where they've actually had very small waves, and you suddenly increase the size of those wave conditions, that's when you start to see some significant problems. And that's what's happening around the world. To bring this a little bit closer to home, um, this is from Duag in uh, Western Ireland. And 37 years ago, they woke up after a storm to discover that their beach, which was at the bottom here, had suddenly just been re reverted into a sort of rocky, a rocky beach. In May of 2017, they woke up after another storm to discover all of their sand had actually all come back again. So they got excited, tourism started to pick up, and then at the beginning of this year, in January, they had another storm and it all got taken away again. So storms can bring in a lot of sand. They can also take a lot of it away. But the crucial thing to remember here is they did it very quickly. It was overnight, rapid changes. Um, also sticking within the, sort of the, the UK um, is the Scilly Isles. I mean, the Scilly Isles are some quite low-lying islands, and the authorities down there take very, you know, an awful lot of care over their, their beaches, and they monitor very carefully what's going on. And this is just from a, a, a range of, uh, you know, from a particular year. And the little red lines shown here show where you've got erosion. But you very often find that where you've got some erosion, just around the corner or somewhere else, you've got an accretion or you've got a buildup of sand. And what the authorities tell me down there is that actually when they sum up the amount of sand around their island, it's actually pretty constant from year to year. It's just that the sand likes to, I guess, go on holiday. It moves around. It moves around the island. And it's obviously, it's, ref it's, it's changing to the changing weather patterns and what's going on. The big problem for, for all of this, though, is that the sand doesn't necessarily end up where you, where you want it. Next slide. 
Now, if you followed the work, you know, the fantastic series by David Attenborough, um, you'll have noticed, of course, that the world is, climate is changing at an unprecedented rate, and we've, we've got to react to that. And in particular, over the last 30 years, there's been an 80% increase in the frequency of severe storms. I mean, last year it got so bad that hurricanes were quite literally lining up, I mean, queuing up to cross the Atlantic. And I, I hope it hasn't gone unnoticed that the hurricane we've just had last month, um, Hurricane Dorian, that, that devastated the Bahamas and caused a lot of flooding, um, that was one of the two worst hurricanes to make landfall ever. Yeah? So we, we're seeing this change dramatically. But, as ever, nature has had a solution. Coral reefs are a fantastic natural barrier. And they, they're fantastic because what they do is they cause waves to break out at sea. And if the, if the reef is wide enough, about 97% of that energy can be dissipated well before it actually reaches the shoreline. And there are around about 200 million people around the world who are protected daily by the existence of these reefs. The Maldives, for example, would just cease to exist if it wasn't for um, coral reefs. So with all of that in mind, we're just copying. So we've sort of set out to try to create artificial reefs. And this technique has been used for the last sort of 25 years to sort of try to restore corals. But we're trying to do this on a much grander scale. And it starts very simply <coughs> that we place a large amount of steel in the sea, sea, and we pass a small electrical current through the water. And this causes calcium carbonate to precipitate out around our rock, uh, around the steel, forming, forming rock, um, exactly like this little piece I've got, got here, which we can pass around. And as this is the Royal Society, I thought we should be a little bit more technical about life and show you some, show you some, some a little bit of science. So if you remember back to your school in chemistry days, you would have had a, a tank that looks a little bit like what we've got on the left-hand side here. This is, a, this is a demonstration tank that we have back in the office. And in there, you would have had your anode and your cathode. And your physics, your chemistry teacher, sorry, would have said, well, let's... let's put some water in there, and then we're going to apply, some, apply a current to this. And he would have looked at what's called the standard reduction tables on the right here, and they would have scanned down and said, right, we, we've got some water, we want to create hydrogen, and we want to get some oxygen off, so we're going to throw in about 1.23 volts as a minimum. Okay? And you'd applied that to this. And what you'd have seen coming off of your anode is little oxygen bubbles. You might have collected that with your, your pipette tube. And off your cathode, you would have seen hydrogen coming off. Now, that's with fresh water, and that's fantastic. What we're doing is taking that exact same method and now dropping it into the sea. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a whole host of other minerals that are in the sea. So from chlorine, sodium, uh, sulfur, uh, magnesium, calcium carbonate. And there's this big, big mi mishmash of stuff that's in here. And what happens with your sort of standard reduction tables is it becomes very important to select out the right voltages to actually drive the, the minerals you want. Now, what you didn't see in your chemistry test was at the anode, you would have actually had hydroxide ions, hydrogen ions, sorry, coming off. Okay? So with the oxygen, alongside that, you had these hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions are really crucial because what they do is they take calcium carbonate that's in solution around the anode, and they cause that to actually break down. You get some calcium ions and some other chemistry I'm not going to go into, but, and effectively, I'm getting the calcium to get sucked across to the cathode. So in a crude sort of sense... What the chemistry is doing for us is allowing us to pump calcium carbonate and other minerals from around the anode towards the cathode. And the other crucial thing about this is, if you followed your chemistry, is that the, around the cathode, we've actually increased the alkalinity of the water. It's become more alkaline. Around the anode, it's actually become slightly more acidic. And if you followed the, you know, Dave and Attenborough and the acidification of the ocean, this is like an, a secondary great benefit for us. But... What I want you to remember from this is we've got to get the voltages exactly right to, to, to encourage the right reactions to, um, on, to, to take place. So, so how do we actually get all of this going on? Right. So this is the range of technologies that we are, we are putting together. I mean, principally, obviously, these two pieces with the intention of trying to create some great rock. And we've started from the pretext that Waves have got a lot of energy, clearly. They're causing a lot of destruction. So why don't we try to harness some of that energy and actually use it for some good and let it, instead, instead of it sort of crashing into our, our, our beaches and causing the destruction? And, of course, we also need the electronics. So we need some nifty electronics to actually manage those voltages and also make sure we distribute that power across the reef, bearing in mind that 
the supply of energy, and we can use wave, but we could also use solar, could also be varying. So what the electronics has to do is actually just manage all of that. And another thing that we feel quite passionate about is the fact that we actually don't know a great, lot, a great deal about our oceans. Uh, you know, it's often said that we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about our oceans. So when we're building this electronics, we're also building an awful lot of instrumentation in there. So we can measure a lot of things that are going on. And we really want to make this a sort of the plug and play of, of the ocean. So people can plug in instrumentation and cameras and we can detect what's going on. But we started this talk saying we were going to talk about how we get our wave energy. So I'm going to just dwell on this just for a moment, about how we came about the shape for our wave paddle, which is a curved paddle, which is quite distinctive from, frankly, anybody else in the, in the wave energy industry. And it starts out very simply that if we're relatively close to the shore, the waves and their energy is coming from the out, out open ocean, it's heading towards the shore. You don't really have any energy coming from the shore going back outwards, apart from you know, may maybe some adverse winds. So this is, in essence, in an essence, asymmetric problem. And as with most things, I mean, if you want to capture the wind when you're driving along in your car, you put your hand out. If you put your hand out flat, you'll feel so forth. You cup your hand a little bit, you'll feel a greater force, all right? Because the wind is traveling towards you. So if it's got an asymmetric problem, we've argued that we ought to have an asymmetric shape to try to capture that energy. And the first thing we did is if we went from what most people are doing in the wave industry, they have like point absorbers around or flat plates, and we curve it, we suddenly find that we get an 80% reduction in the weight um, for the same strength. And this is, you know, if you just think about your pizza when you're trying to eat it, if you go to pick up a pizza, you bend it, it you can pick it up, wave it around, it's quite strong, but if you don't, it's just going to flop to the floor. So we get some, some significant benefits there. The other great thing we get from curving the shape is we also see the power going up when our power capture from the waves goes up by about two to three times. And this also brings me on to the, sort of the final point in terms of why we want to use wave energy over, say, solar. It's very often they don't actually have the space to put solar panels, but also you've got to run a cable from the solar panels all the way out across the beach into the ocean. And it's that length of that cable that becomes a critical issue, particularly if you want to keep it as a low voltage cable. So we reckon that anything over about 300 meters off from the shore, you are highly advised to use wave energy as opposed to solar. If it's much closer, then you would, you would use solar. Um, so moving on, this is roughly how a project might start. Okay? So this is, this is an installation in, in Cosmo. So you start, you put down your steel mesh. Um, you would always... If you see fragments of corals from, that have been damaged from previous storms or something like that, you might attach those onto your reef. And in addition, we're working very closely with a lot of coral hatcheries around the world. So there's uh, groups in Bermuda, Bahamas, and obviously in Mexico, and, and uh, frankly everywhere nowadays, who are growing from, from small polyps um, corals. And we're working very closely with them, so we would attach onto the, the, onto the reef um, these coral fragments, and then you apply the power, and you will then start to see, see your rock growing on these reefs, but it also benefits the corals. And as I don't know if I mentioned, but corals, generally speaking, appear, from the science that we've seen so far, grow about two to three times faster than they would otherwise. So there's a, a significant benefit to both the ecosystem and ourselves. And as you can appreciate, coral reefs themselves are, you know, 25% of all marine life live in or are born in within coral reefs. So with a, a, an ecosystem that has been, in a sense, destroyed, um, we've lost around about a quarter of all our coral reefs. We hope that by what we're doing here, we can not only provide coastal protection, create those reefs that cause waves to break, but we can also um, bring back these vital ecosystems and helps to you know, repopulate populate fish, which brings me back to this guy. He seems pretty happy with what we're up to. And on we go. And this is really just the finish. Um, I want to just bring one quick, quick point to note. Um, the, our friends in the Bahamas have been absolutely devastated. And we've been working very closely with a group out there who are trying to bring aid to that group. Um, so we've been helping to manage a website called Give to the Bahamas. So if anyone's feeling generous, I would love it if you could just make a small donation, five pounds, 500 pounds, whatever would be fantastic. And all of that aid will go directly to them. And just to bring him back to the point of the talk, you know, our focus really here is you know, trying to bring back these fantastic ecosystems. Uh, we're working very closely with hotels because we can also bring great, great dive tourism sites. It also enhances fisheries. And as I've said earlier, we want to try and get as much data out of this as possible and really learn from what's going on out there. Thank you.